what I want to do really, really fast, because I don't know how your textbook came up with some of this garbage, <laughs> these concepts, excuse me. Um, I want to go through some of the terms. Thank you, the jerk. Yeah, um, I want to go through some of these, these ideas with you just to make sure you're familiar with them. The first one that the author of your textbook talks about is the inflation fallacy. He goes through the idea that, you know, for people in an economy, um, when inflation happens, you don't actually lose buying power because your wages will adjust and you get paid more money, therefore there's no real impact of inflation. Um, <laughs> Nonsense. In the long run, that's true. You know, the idea of if you ever got to the long run that, you know, wages and prices would adjust and everything would be cool, that's great. Except at any given moment, you're not in the long run. You're in the now. You're what's happening today. And I don't know anyone who has a job where they can negotiate their salary on a daily basis or a six-month basis or, you know, really have any negotiating power at all based on price, you know, based on price level. So I would say the inflation fallacy is a fallacy. So that fallacy would be the inflation fallacy fallacy. A falsehood. It's a good SAT word. All right. The second one that he talks about are shoe leather costs. Um, this is one that I stop it. This is this is another one that I've never heard of, and this is how he explains it. Now, when you have inflation, and you know when inflation happens, you have a motivation to pull your money out of the bank. And it's very inconvenient for you to um, convert your assets into cash to adjust the fact that, you know, having a change in price level is affecting your buying power. Literally, all the times that you have to keep running to the bank, you're wearing out your shoes. Therefore, it's called shoe leather costs. Um, I, anyway, I, I got nothing. The third one we've talked about before, menu costs involves the cost of changing your prices and communicating those costs to customers. Um, you know, you can think of it literally as printing new menus, but please don't write that on the test again because that's not the only thing it means. Changing prices and communicating those prices to customers. Um, you know, think about changing all of the signage in a, in a big store, for example. That takes time, it takes manpower, it takes resources to keep reprinting everything. They pain the button. Think about pretty much anything except for printing new menus. Well, okay. All right. The fourth one is tax distortions. The tax code is written based on your nominal income, meaning the amount of money that you have earned in a given calendar year. It does not take into account that the value of that money changes based on what's happening with the price level. So it doesn't look at taxing your income, not it doesn't tax your real income, it taxes your nominal income. And if your real income is fluctuating and going down based on prices going up, the tax code does not compensate for that. It doesn't play into it at all because the tax code is only dealing with nominal, not adjusted for inflation. So that's the tax distortion that comes into play here. Um, I would say that another way to look at tax distortions, not tying it to inflation necessarily, but tying it to cost of living, is that the cost of living can reduce your disposable income. And so someone who makes $100,000 in one part of the country ends up with a lot more buying power than someone who makes $100,000 in an area that has a higher cost of living. So that's another tax distortion, not caused by inflation, but it's another drawback to how the tax code works, which is that it only taxes your nominal income and doesn't consider any other factors. Now, the fifth one is confusion tied to inadequate information. And I would say that this has been a real problem uh, with the current recession. 
in that people get misinformation from the mainstream media. Um, they get misinformation from looking to um, political pundits and talking heads, blah, 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 on TV. And they don't really have a good understanding of how the forces actually work. If people had a better understanding of the system, then they wouldn't do things like go cash out their 401ks when the value drops. That's not the best approach, and yet millions of people started to do that when the stock market tanked after you had things like um, Bear Stearns and AIG and all this other you know, turmoil in the financial markets. Bad idea, but people did it because they really didn't know about you know, long-term trends. All right, the last one here that we've already talked about in terms of who gets hurt by and who benefits from inflation, we've got to look at debtors and creditors. Debtors benefit because when they borrow money, it ends up being worth more than the money they pay back. Therefore, they benefit, the lender gets hurt by it, that's the redistribution of wealth that we're talking about. So, tied mainly to debtors and creditors. I think that's the easiest way to remember it. But anyway, these are a bunch of terms that are thrown at you by your book, some of them more valid than others. Um, but you will definitely see some of these concepts on the AP exam, even if we're not tying them to these specific terms. Um, this one, I don't know. Well, there's, I, a, cost, I, there's uh, a cost of the amount of time you spend in liquidizing your assets liquidating one of those. Making them more liquid. Yeah. Melting your bank account. That's right. You spend